My work looking at the relationship between humans and nature really evolved originally from my work in China looking at ancient agricultural landscapes and how the ecology of these landscapes has changed as they've made the transition from a traditional state to a very intensively managed modern state with lots of chemical inputs, this sort of thing. And as I watched these systems evolve and change into these more intensive industrial systems, I realized that the local changes that you see in rural China really reflect a global change and in fact are driving global change. And that got me interested in the global relationship between humans and nature uh, that has really been left out of the way that biologists and ecologists look at how the biosphere works. Uh, the classic view of the biosphere is that we basically have uh, these global patterns created by climate, such as the grasslands, the tropical rainforest, deserts, and this sort of thing, and that we can look at the patterns of the biosphere this way. Yet, realistically, you look out the window almost anywhere and you're going to see a completely transformed environment. There's a whole human ecology uh, out there that's global and essentially the, the ecology that we really have, the human nature that we really have, rather than this classic wild nature that we, we dream about. Ecological services are an attempt to create an economic value for natural processes in ecosystems. Uh, for example, pollination or uh, say water purification. And I think the biggest problem with this concept is that it puts engineered ecosystems like, for example, uh, with pollination we can, we can use domesticated bees as a substitute. Or with water purification, you can build a water purification plant. And indeed, they both cost money. But if you really look at this, if you want to put up nature against an engineered ecosystem or an engineered system of, of some sort, like a water treatment plant, I'm going to bet you that over time, the engineering technology is going to make it cheaper than it's going to be in a natural state. So the idea that we could essentially treat nature as just a set of services we're going to get into substituting these services and we're going to do a better job with engineering than we are just using the natural system. A great example is fish. Right? Wild fish productivity uh, is not something that is going to continue to be uh, going up as we harvest it heavily, whereas in a fish farm it's completely different. You can actually scale up and increase the productivity of, of fish production in those systems. So treating nature as a set of services and valuing it in that format is going to set up ultimately a competition between human ingenuity and natural uh, productivity. And I think human ingenuity is going to win out. And that, so it's, it's not a safe way to protect nature by valuing it just in terms of services. There's a lot more to nature than a bunch of services. In fact, it really takes a lot of rethinking of really your natural impulses toward the way we perceive, uh, say, a, a quote, natural ecosystem in that you know, we don't start off coming to the place and go, oh, look, there's some good pollination service, there's some good water treatment, you know, what a wonderful ecosystem this is. We start off with a deep feeling of, uh, of connection in many cases, or at least a, a kind of, of awe, or uh, Im it, it's, it's impressive to see how these systems are. We don't quite understand, they're so much mysterious. And we value them in some way because of that. Their value lies in their nature, not in their, for example, their services. So I see if you're really trying to conserve nature in the long term, just valuing servicing uh, of, of humans you know, is not going to preserve nature. We need to keep that classic view of nature in some ways as a thing valuable in itself. Well, there's a lot of uh, unquantified services, obviously. And uh, some people have talked about, and this is an interesting element that, unfortunately, I think you can also reproduce. But nature never produces one service. It's always doing a lot of different things, some of which we don't even know how to value. There's no, we may not even know that they are valuable until we, we, they're gone. For example, there could be a plant out there that has some compound in it that is extremely valuable for curing cancer, but we don't know that yet. And so if we don't preserve that, in, that ecosystem and, and we lose that plant, we've lost some, some value that we never even knew we had. So there's a lot of unvalued uh, nature out there always. That's a given. So it's, it's almost impossible to accurately value nature. That's my opinion. So it's a dangerous game to put numbers on it because you're always going to miss out something important, which is a lot less true for, for example, engineered services. Uh, those, those you really pretty much are just looking at one thing at a time and can understand it. So that's one thing. Another is, is this idea of synergistic services, right? Nature doesn't just produce one service. It produces lots of different kinds of services. And that's just like managing your economic portfolio. Do you want to have your money invested in one stock? 
that's not a very wise strategy, and nobody with lots of money ever does that. It's a diversified set of services, and nature d also does that. On the other hand, I think that you can create a kind of a diverse set of engineered services and, and manage in that way too. So it's not impossible to replicate that with engineering. But generally, with nature itself, you're getting a lot more than you can ever value with money. Yeah, I think that in some ways, the origins of environmental conservation, the roots of it, in fact, people like John Muir, who had a big influence on early conservation, one of the, the, the earliest thinkers on it, uh, is really talking just about that, that we have to value these places for our kind of the mysterious connection, not because of the numbers we can generate to justify it as an economic service, but because of the fact that we love it and that we have this connection with it that we really can't even explain. And that's good enough. That's a reason in itself because it's very hard to produce that. Humans have a hard time producing an ecosystem like that. On the other hand, now we find ourselves on a planet with very little wild uh, ecosystems left. Pretty much everything we have has either been directly transformed by us or is in the process of dealing with climate change and being transformed indirectly. Um, so there's very little wild nature left. And are we going to be able to value that in the same way we value a place that is really no evidence of human mingling? Is, is that going to be as valuable? And I, I think that one of the elements for, in a sense, the survival of nature and the survival of nature values and conservation is keeping that attachment as we go through this journey with nature. We're taking it on a new journey. We're going where it's never gone before. We have to keep our love affair with nature going. And that's not going to be just about numbers. It's going to be about keeping this mysterious connection that there's something out there that we can appreciate that is beyond our direct creation.